Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another Yours event, your Heritage Research Seminars, for any of you who are new to these. Um, so we have a series of Tuesday evening seminars on a heritage theme throughout the autumn and the spring terms, and they align closely with, with our course content, module content, in the, uh, the Master's programme. Um, and it's a great pleasure this evening to welcome uh, our speaker, Gabriel Moshenska. Gabe is someone I've known for a long time now. We have overlapping interests in World War II archaeology, conflict archaeology, which I think is where our, our interests first sort of coincided, but also cultural heritage and, to a lesser extent, public archaeology, because it's not so much my field, but it's very much Gabe's. And, uh, and Gabe is going to talk about that um, this afternoon. The title of Gabe's talk is uh, Performance and Display at the Birth of Public Archaeology. Gabe is a lecturer in public archaeology at uh, the Institute of Archaeology at UCL, and it's a, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome into the department, Gabe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, shall we begin? Um, I, I use the phrase the birth of public archaeology just to really to, um, get people in. Um, it, it's a lie, as titles are always a lie. I think the birth of public archaeology is when Helena of, of Constantinople returned from digging up Jerusalem with the crown of thorns, the true cross, and some nails from the crucifixion and said, everyone, look, 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 look what I found. That, 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 that was reasonably widely re reported at the time. So that is definitely the birth of public archaeology. I'm speaking of a period a little bit later on, and I have notes, could excuse me. Um, my focus is the Congress of the British Archaeological Association in Canterbury in August of 1844, the first archaeological conference in the UK, if not the world. The very idea of scholarly congresses open to the public was a novelty in Britain pioneered by the British Association for the Advancement of Science a few years earlier. Um, the organizers' excitement and sense that they were blazing a new trail is palpable in their letters and diaries and writings at the time. Alongside the papers that were read at the um, conference, there was a lively program of excursions, what were called conversaciones, dances, and other distractions. And in this talk, um, I'm going to look at three events during the British Archaeological Association, I'll say BAA's, um, Canterbury Congress. The first is the trip to watch the excavation of seven barrows at Breach Down, a um, live excavation. The second is the visit to the Fawcett Collection of, of Antiquities at Heppington. And the third is the, the unrolling of an Egyptian mummy in a theatre in Canterbury. I'm interested in how seeing science um, in action creates knowledge. I'm interested in the role of the gaze and audiences in the formation of archaeological knowledge and what this means for public archaeology and the public understanding of the past more broadly. Um, this work that I'm, that I'm engaged in is based on documentary and archival uh, research that I carried out at the Society of antiquaries at the British Library and the Beinecke Rare Books and Man Manuscripts Library at Yale, to all of whom I'm very, very grateful. And it's part of a wider project to situate the, the history of archaeology and public archaeology within the intellectual histories of the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries. As a public archaeologist, I'm particularly interested in the geographies of knowledge. Um, models and methodologies that have emerged in the history of science in recent years, um, examining the physical and social spaces in which scientific knowledge creation occurs, and the, the roles of audiences and eyewitnesses in these early epistemologies. Um, in the first half of the 19th century, the period I'm mostly f f uh, focusing on here, um, we begin to see audiences for science, including archaeology, that include people who are not elite males for the first time. And we see, as ever with any kind of progress, we see the predictable 
reaction against that progress from those elites. Making archaeology public was a political act in 1844, just as it is now. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to be looking at three questions, if you like. Firstly, how public was the British Archaeological Association's Congress? What were the conditions of access? Who was in and who was still out? How was that different to how things had been before? Secondly, I want to know what roles performance and display played in this opening up of archaeology, what I believe to be an opening up of archaeology. And thirdly, I'm interested in how these practices and processes were received and perceived by their immediate audiences and by others. And I'll return to these questions at the end of, of the paper. First, a bit of historical background, because this is um, historical research. For those of you who are familiar with the British Archaeological Association, this might all seem a bit surreal. They are one of the most staid and sensible <laughs> scholarly organisations in Britain. I don't think anything like a scandal is likely to befall. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's slightly unfair. But um, rewind to 1844 and they are at the cutting edge of pretty much everything. Founded in 1843 by a London-based group led by the um, pharmacist Charles Roach Smith and the writer and editor Thomas Wright. The 1830s and, and 40s were the period when lots of learning societies began to emerge in the sciences, arts, religion, architecture and so on. Um, this intellectual growth in the age of reform was driven in part by the discoveries made and connections enabled by the construction of the railway networks across Britain. When you start cut, uh, doing cutting through hills, putting railways, you will find things. Archaeological things, paleontological things, geological things, things. Um, most importantly, though, the most important factor in all this is the rapid growth of the urban middle class. The rise of archaeology is the rise of the middle class in Britain. Um, so the British Archaeological Association had its roots in the Society of Antiquaries of, Lon of London at that time, although it may be hard to imagine now, a rather dusty and hidebound institution which, like the British Museum at the time, had no interest at all in British antiquities and British archaeology. Um, or indeed in pretty much anything non-classical, or that was starting to change. The Numismatics um, Society had formed several years earlier, again, out of frustration with the Society of Antiquaries' unwillingness to, to form a new, new numismatic group. And the formation of the British Archaeological Association can be seen as part of the same processes. There are interesting parallels as well with the emergence of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, which emerged at this period out of similar frustrations with the, the Royal Society. And it's interesting that um, one of the leaders of the British Archaeological Association was one of the forces of reaction in the Royal, the Royal Society at the same time. I say it's interesting, interesting to me, probably, not widely interesting. Anyway, the most important factor in all this is while fellowships of the Society of Antiquaries and the Royal Society were by nomination and election from within, maintaining it very much as in crowd, memberships of the British Association of the Advancement of Science and the British Archaeological Association were much more open. Pretty much anyone could pay a, a membership fee of the equivalent of around £120 a year, and it was in theory open to anybody. It's worth noting again this role of social class in the, in the, the BAA. The most active members in these early days were met, metropolitan middle class men. I've mentioned Roach, Smith and Wright already, but also the playwright J.R. Planche and the surgeon Thomas Pettigrew, who I'm working on a, bi a biography of and I can bore on for hours, but I won't. And they and their friends made up roughly half of the committee, the organising committee of the BAA. The other half was made up of gentlemen of leisure, academics, senior churchmen and aristocrats. They regarded themselves so much as amateurs as opposed to the professionals of Wright, Roach Smith and friends. And it was the professionals who pushed for a Congress. 
and the amateurs who pushed against the idea of a conquest. These lines, these lines of division are drawn quite early on. Um, the decision to hold a congress was made in early 1844, and a circular was distributed amongst the memberships um, soliciting papers, asking for, for contributions of, of talks, and asking for people to purchase tickets. Again, at about a guinea, which was uh, um, in the region of hundred pounds, not extortionate. A draft program was drawn up for the Congress, organized around four main themes, primeval antiquities, medieval antiquities, architecture, and history. Arrangements were made with the mayor of Canterbury and other notables. Block bookings were made in all the hotels and inns in town, and around 200 tickets were sold for the Congress at one guinea each. Each of these two tickets entitled the bearer to, to admit themselves and a lady <laughs> to the conference, to the cathedral, you got free entrance to the cathedral, and to all of the evening soirees. Three of these roughly 200 tickets were sold to women, but many, many women attended as plus ones, if, if you like, and these were by no means dragged there against their will. Um, the Congress modelled itself very much on the British Association of the Advancement of Sciences first Congress in York in 1831, which was itself based on earlier German models of what a Congress would, would look like. But at this time, it is still very new. No one, very, very few of the people going to the Congress would have any idea what a Congress is. No one had any idea, much idea what a, what a Congress was. It was really quite um, working with a fairly blank slate. It's interesting to me how little has changed in the past 170 odd years in what a conference looks like. From the start then, the, the amateur half of the Central Committee of the BAA opposed the Congress, stating it was too provincial, likely to be an embarrassing failure, too commercial, and generally vulgar. <laughs> vulgar is an interesting word. Vulgarization is another word for popularization. And by vulgar, they meant too popular. This set the stage again for fights and arguments later on. And this reactionary end of the, of the association did not attend the conference. Several of them pretended to be ill to avoid it, which is quite pathetic, really. Um, the event itself started badly. Um, this was the hall, this is the uh, theater in Canterbury where it was based. The opening speech was by every account, thunderingly boring, and went on far too long. <laughs> and the first day of the Congress was incredibly badly organised. Um, the rest of the week after this was much improved. Um, each section, each of the four sections I mentioned before, had their own meetings to hear papers on every alternate day. And on intervening days, there were plenary sessions, day trips, outings, parties, and so on. Um, the primeval section heard papers on Caesar's landing place in Kent and on Egyptian and Roman antiquities. The medieval section had papers on church wall paintings and ecclesiastical embroideries. The architectural section got a very popular paper on Canterbury Cathedral, and the historical section heard reports on the holdings of local archives and collections. Despite what sounds like a fairly dry program, the event was stunningly well received by everyone involved. Diaries and letters um, that, that I found from the event have this overwhelming sense of excitement. Everyone's excited to be there. Everyone's excited to be around other archaeologists, other antiquarians as part of a nascent national community that would then form itself into the system of county archaeological societies that we're reasonably familiar with, those of you who are British-based archaeologists. Um, and it was it was so exciting. Charles Roach Smith recalled years later that he completely lost his appetite through the entire week and barely slept. And eventually called on Pettigrew, who was a doctor as well as an antiquarian, and said, "What's going wrong with me?" And Pettigrew said, "You're just very excited. <laughs> You're hugely excited. We're all ex excited. People weren't sleeping, were eating, were staying up late, dancing. It's um, it's all a bit familiar. For those of you who go to lots of conferences, really." <laughs> The, the, the committee had arranged a quite impressive programme of events 
uh, aside from the, the paper, I'd say conversaciones, visits to archives, and the day trips. Again, constantly modeling themselves on the, the, the congresses of the BAAS. The events that I'm interested in are those with an element of performance of visual display. These are, these are vital parts of developing epistemologies in early science, witnessing, watching, under, un, understanding. And to some extent, this, epistemo this epistemology of witnessing survives in archaeology pretty much uniquely in the um, scholarly world. It still counts to see something because we still do un unrepeatable experiments. And performances and displays also serve as mechanisms for making work open, for making things accessible. And that's part of my, my aim here, is to understand that. So the first event I, I want to look at is the, ex excavate, is the excursion to watch the excavation of seven burrows on the estate of Lord Albert Conningham, who was president of the, Brit the British Archaeological Association. Um, Charles Roach Smith called this an attractive and scientific feature in the week's proceedings. And it was recorded in some detail in press reports of the Congress. So there's a text I'll read. Under his lordship's supervision, a number of these barrows were dug to within about a foot of the bottom before the arrival of the visitors in order that the deposits might be uncovered in their presence. Eight barrows were successfully opened for their ins inspection. The only interruption arose from, from a heavy shower of rain, which so far from dampening the zeal of the visitors, that many, both ladies and gentlemen, raised their, their umbrellas, if they had any, and stood patiently looking at the operations of the excavators. This text reveals quite a lot about the specific expedition and about 19th century archaeology more broadly. It's important to place this performance within the context of 18th and 19th century barrow digging, in which these earth mounds are destroyed with startling speed in a matter of hours to get access to the graves under them. Um, and it's also worth noting the distinction that Wright makes in his extract between the archaeologists, those who watch, and the excavators, those who dig. Um, it's also notable the excavations were very much staged to the extent that the earth mounds were removed. Presumably this, this will be something which would not be of any interest to the archaeologists. And the burial chambers were left barely covered so that you could do a kind of big reveal. A second account of the same event focuses in particular among, in, on the women amongst um, this rain sodden audience. And again, these are, these are images supposedly of this specific event. Um, in spite of this untoward occurrence, the rain, the unsheltered archaeologists through whom the storm riddled right merrily, I love his style, Unflinchingly pursued their investigations after remnants of things which had passed away, which many of them had travelled hundreds of miles to witness. Nor was the the, the gentlest sex deferred um, from anxiety, sorry, from anxiously hovering on the, the bricks of the graves, lest they should miss any discoveries of articles fashioned by long forgotten hands. So women are allowed to watch as long as they anxiously hover. <laughs> on the edge. This is progress of a sort. And, but he emphasizes again the archaeologist's aim was to witness. He was particularly struck, this author, by the keenness of the, the, the women watching um, the, the excavation, saying that it was only the fact that the w women were there watching that, presented, that prevented the workmen from taking sh shelter from heavy rain. They were sh shamed in staying on the site, pretty much. To understand this barrow digging expedition as a performance and a spectacle requires understanding of the BAA's aim to propagate the understanding and appreciation of archaeology through these same methods of congresses, exhibitions and demonstrations used by promoters of natural sciences in the same period. For early Victorian popularizers of science, the purpose of public experiments was not only to educate and to entertain, but to train people in seeing science. Um, the historian of science, Ewan Morris, has said, when visitors to late 18th or early 19th century exhibitions saw science on show, they were, in a sense, being taught how to see science. So the staging of this barrow excavation, including careful preparation, so only the final stages 
would be seen corresponds very much with this early 19th century idea of experiment. The crowd of middle class and upper class ladies and gentlemen who the BAA brought to this rainy hilltop were not only learning about barrows, they were learning the 19th century skill of how to observe an excavation. And for many of them, of the urban middle classes, this was their first experience of field archaeology. On to the next part of the BAA's performances and displays. Excuse me one second. One of the most active barrow diggers in the Canterbury area, a hundred years or so earlier, was the antiquarian Brian Fawcett. In his memoirs, published long after he, he died, he described how in July of 1771, he set out to excavate a group of nine barrows near Canterbury. He and his workmen arrived at the site um, very early in the morning and worked incredibly hard at a feverish pace because, as he said, I know myself liable to be pestered with a numerous set of troublesome spectators. Setting ourselves immediately to the business, we finished our work, nine barrows, this is, in little more than two hours. During this time, it being so, so early in the day, we had very little or no interruption, either from the curiosity or impertinence of passengers or other idle spectators, the teasingness and plague of whom's ill-timed attendance in business of this sort is not to be conceived, but by those who have, like myself, have, have uh, had the disagreeable experience of it. Fawcett was not a public archaeologist, shall we say, <laughs> and he would not have approved of the expedition laid on for the BAA many years later on. Let's be clear, if the Lord and Lady of the Manor had come by, Fawcett would have been more than happy to show them around and talk to them for hours on end. But this was the wrong kind of audience. People from the village who were interested, wrong kind of audience, cannot be allowed, must be avoided. Fawcett excavated around 600 barrows in Kent, the majority of them Anglo-Saxon, and accumulated a vast and valuable collection of Anglo-Saxon antiquities of various kinds. Seventy years after he died, his collection came to the attention of Charles Roach Smith, again, one of the organisers of the, of the Congress. And Roach Smith visited the family home, visited the collection, um, and studied it over several months together with Fawcett's grandson. And this collection included daggers, axes, spears, amber beads, glass beads, amethyst beads, belt buckles, pottery vessels, glass vessels, brooches, and so on and so on. And, we were, and Roach Smith recalled years later, it was at my request and under a regulation suggested by me that the British Archaeological Association was received at Heppington and permitted access to antiquarian riches. So by this time, many of the members of the BAA were very much involved in Anglo-Saxon archaeology. This was one of their interests. Not least the, president's, the president of the association, Lord Conningham. And so this visit to the Fawcett Collection got everyone very excited indeed. Now, Roach Smith refers to a regulation suggested by me for visiting the collection. At this time, there was no standard pattern for a group of people visiting someone's private collection. It didn't not happen. Antiquarians didn't come together in their hundreds and then just descend on someone's home. You might entertain one or two and show them around yourself. Um, Roach Smith describes the event. I arranged that a small room in which the precious collections were kept would be visited in detachments under my own guidance and that then the visitors would be conducted to the hall for refreshments. And I had police in attendance throughout. <laughs> Now he's navigating the British class system very carefully here. You can bring all these all these tradesmen, and they'll they'll have tea, but they won't crowd around. And you'll have the police there to make sure no one pockets anything, because who knows? At the time, again, it was common for people to hold conversaciones in their homes, where invited guests would bring along antiquities, old manuscripts, things which interested them or might spark some kind of learning conversation, um, someone famously would bring Oliver Cromwell's head to parties on a stick, mummified as a talking point. This is the kind of thing you did for fun in the early 19th century. 
got great description of someone who was at one of these parties and said, where's the effect of, there he is again with Oliver Cromwell's head. <laughs> um, so th this is why Roach Smith police this event so originally, because there was no precedent for this kind of thing. And this had an unexpected result in itself. Um, Thomas Bateman, the um, Derbyshire antiquarian, and very famous barrow digger, attended. And um, Dr. Fawcett, grandson of the excavator, was very keen to meet him. So Charles Roach Smith asked him to stay behind. Bateman mis misunderstood this, thought he was being refused entry to the collection for some reason, stormed off in a half, went back to Canterbury, tried to storm out of the entire Congress, couldn't find a horse, fortunately, so stayed and, and, and then everything got cleared up. But this sense of insult and risk was quite live in all, in all of this stuff. These were prickly people. The best analogy I can find for, read, for studying their, their interactions through their letters, their, um, their conversations, their accounts of each other, is it's like Mean Girls. Any of you have yeah. seen that <laughs> wonderful thing? It's very Mean Girls. Um, Roach Smith used the general success of this visit to the collection to persuade the Fawcett family to publish a catalogue of their collection. And he said of an, another visitor that I induced him to make public some of his collection through printing it. Visiting is one way of making things public, publication literally an, another way. And this was something which again, the publication of private collections just starting uh, to take place. But this visit was by and large a huge success. The members of the association who attended said it was their favorite part of the entire Congress. And the um, Fawcett collection, which was and still is an astonishingly important collection is now um, held by Liverpool museums. Because as so often, the British Museum had no interest in British antiquities. God love them. This brings us on to, oh, I forgot, some more of the, of the collection beautifully illustrated um, to the mummy, which you might think has no place in a conference of the British Archaeological Association. Many people felt that way. Unfortunately, Thomas Pettigrew's secretary, sorry, treasurer of the association was a better mummy unroller to the extent that he was known as Mummy Pettigrew because he liked mummies. Um, so Friday the 13th of September, an aus auspicious date, 8, eight o'clock in the evening, this is the very end of the Congress. Oh, sorry, there's, there's a sudden laughter there, I wasn't quite sure why, I'm going to check my flies yeah. um, Thomas Pettigrew stands in front of an audience of several hundred people get, um, gathered in a theatre in Canterbury and begins to unroll the linen bandages of an Egyptian mummy. Um, working with a knife and a chisel, succeeded by his son William, Pettigrew removes the layers of cloth and bitumen until the body of the mummy could be seen through the bandages and the face was completely revealed. And according to a report from the time, the theatre presented a gay appearance, being well filled with the most respectable audience. The leading families of the neighbourhood were present and the most intense interest prevailed. Stage decorations were got up with great care. Mr. Pettigrew and the mummy at the centre, supported on either side by antiquities, tastefully arranged so as to give full effect to this imposing scene. This is not this particular unrolling, this is an event in Bristol, but the style of decoration, the you know, texts hanging off heads and things, is the way mummy unrollings were traditionally staged. There was first a lecture by TJ Pettigrew on mummies, which lasted an hour, and then Pettigrew, assisted by his son, began the unrolling. The greatest interest was evinced by spectators from time to time, pieces of the bandages were handed to the ladies in the boxes, although the cloth had a peculiar and disagreeable smell. The dust pervaded the atmosphere, was inhaled by all persons. After an hour and a half, the mummy, which proved to be that of a young man, was raised to its feet and presented to the company and was received with enthusiastic applause. This is your standard Victorian mummy unrolling, when it goes well, pretty much. The unrolling began at 8pm, didn't finish until 11, 
whereupon a number of those present retired to the assembly rooms nearby to dance, as reported by the local paper, the Kent Herald, the title, The Archaeological Polka. Um, in, addition, in, addition, in, uh, in addition to the amusements provided by the Archaeological Association, it appears on Friday evening, after a very interesting ceremony of unrolling the mummy, a select portion adjourned to Barnes's rooms for the purpose of indulging in the polka, a very pleasant means of passing an hour. One of the, the ladies present said, is Julia, said, after contemplating the horrible mummy for so many hours, she could compare the, the, the polka, which immediately followed with Holbein's dance of death. <laughs> this, the set design is significant. Peter Cruz unrollings were commonly performed against a backdrop of this kind. But the place of spectators and their response to these performances are of particular value in understanding the nature and significance of the event. It's clear from the description that the unrolling was not merely a visual spectacle, but a multi-sensory experience for everyone there. The money was seen and smelt, the dust and bandages were tasted and smelt and touched. The intense interest and enthusiasm ascribed to the audience cannot be explained by the novelty of this alone. By 1844, mummy unrollings were a fairly common occurrence, even in provincial towns. But this was a particularly spectacular one. And of course, it feeds into the Victorian obsession with sex and death. And the and uh, mummy rollings do tend to have a, a sense of a necrophiliac striptease about them. How am I doing for time? So I'm going to say, I'm, 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 some minutes, fine, wonderful. <laughs> mummy rollings are fairly peculiar events. I could go on longer, I won't. I need to move on. So I want to return now to the questions I asked at the start. How public was the BAA Congress? It was, by the standards of the time, astonishingly accessible. Unlike the Society of Antiquaries, it was open to anyone who could pay a fairly moderate fee, making it accessible to basically the entire middle class. Women could attend with their husbands and fathers, or were registered for themselves, and many did. Although, as far as I know, none gave papers. The Society of Antiquaries, in contrast, only elected their first women as fellows nearly 100 years afterwards. The events such as the mummy un unrolling were also made open to the local Canterbury residents, again, middle class and above, but this was still unprecedented and extremely popular. What roles then did performance and display play in this opening up of archaeology generally within the Congress? It's clear that plenty of people enjoyed the actual papers, the presentations and discussions, but the greatest excitement and the sense of coming together for the first time as the British archaeological community comes from the outings and exhibitions and events. And again, the inclusion of women and local residents is a factor in this as well. Both the Barrow excavation and the display of the Fawcett collection were hosted by local elite families and individuals and were attended by a much more mixed party than families like that would normally have entertained. Making things public is political and British class boundaries don't move easily or quickly. So in the aftermath of the Congress, the BAA was divided. The members of the Central Committee who had run the event felt that they, they had triumphed, it had been a huge success, but also felt let down by those who had not turned up and who had poo-pooed the, the whole thing. Whereas the, the, the other side, the amateur faction, felt that the event was an embarrassment, that the excursions and demonstrations were what they called cockneyisms or vulgar popularizations of archaeology. The Athenaeum magazine, which, which was particularly hard line all, their, all, all this, said, we object to dissertations on Egyptian hieroglyphics and to disapprove altogether of Egyptian mummies being opened, however amusing they may be to the inhabitants of Canterbury. <laughs> Basically saying, this is small time and provincial and not to be taken seriously. Um, 
Wright wrote to Triple Broke Smith that the article of the Athenaeum is very nasty indeed, enough to damn the Athenaeum forever in the minds of every man of sense and honesty. Fair enough. Punch magazine was even nastier. They said any persons may not be aware that the archaeologians are a body of savants who devote their whole life to the unrolling of mummies, the, the, the opening of barrows, and the pickaxing of ancient tumuli. A select few of these enthusiasts have dug up a series of bricks, which they declare will form materials for the future historian. Shades of Eddie's art series of small walls there. If that was the case, they say, Gibbon would have written his decline and fall amongst a lot of dry rubbish, and Hume would have pursued his researches among the clearest collections of John Johnson and Bird, who were the leading dustmen of his own era. For our own part, we have little sympathy for the archaeologians. The unrolling of mummies is a sort of monomania with Mr. Pettigrew, and as it's harmless, we do not see that it calls the energies of a commissioner of lunacy. Nastius. This gentleman amateur faction of the BAA also objected very much to Thomas Wright's archaeological album, which was a publication he wrote based on the Congress, which was written in an accessible manner, beautifully illustrated and very popular. And the committee split in half. Both, of course, declared itself to be the true British Archaeological Association. And in due course, the amateur branch, which included most of the aristocrats and senior churchmen, um, changed their name to the Archaeological Institute, later the Royal Archaeological Institute. And the two groups remain unreconciled to this very day. Completely pointlessly. But there you are. Um, in putting on, then, these excursions, demonstrations, spectacles, and displays, the BAA were aligning themselves with the cutting edge of popular science and popular scholarship at a time when the formats of congresses and conferences were not yet set in stone, even dances. By digging a, a li little deeper into the context and wider significances of these practices, I want to move away very much from the idea of Victorian antiquarians as dry as dust oddballs towards a more nuanced understanding of how they understood themselves as gentlemen and ladies of science. People of scholarship, culture, who while undoubtedly cliquey and bitchy as hell, were committed to opening up the past to a wider and more inclusive audience beyond the elite men of the Society of Antiquaries, to their glory. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gay. Fascinating, and um, bringing that back round to the present with the, uh, the relationships between organisations that many of us are, are members of. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, so, questions, anybody? Thoughts, comments, observations? Sure. Just an observation really gave that um, this kind of continuing story of public archaeology there in the sense that um, when the BM would buy the Fawcett collection, I think there's something to do with him buying the whole collection, not just the Kingston Brooch, and so they put it in and other stuff. So, so it was of, it, I don't know how it came about, but anyway, it was bought by Joseph Mayer in Liverpool for the free public museum. And when it opened, it, it was inundated with visitors, and it became really kind of um, a showcase for archaeology for the first time, really, in the north of England. So that, uh, well, in the northwest of England, shall we say. So it kind of had an afterlife of the public archaeology, which is quite interesting to look at. And that was 1855. How interesting. Yeah. And that, I mean, that must have had some kind of link then, because L Liverpool and, and museums in Liverpool have actually were also on that cutting edge into the yeah. late 19th the century, as well. particularly around Egypt. But yeah, yeah, the, yeah. So very advanced. Tent, you know, Liverpool, but, uh, yeah. Odd, isn't it? Yeah. But how, oh, thank you for that. Can I ask this very quickly? Are there any members of the Royal Archaeological Institute or the British Archaeological Association? RAI. Yeah. RAI. <laughs> One RAI. No, no, no BAA, shockingly. <laughs> The um, journals of both of those organisations go all the way back to these 1840s. The Archaeological Journal, which is now belongs to the, the RAI, belonged to the BAA, but they took it to the BAA and have started 
their own journal. Again, fractious as hell to start with, and now the BA's journal is archaeologically name only, I feel. It's already our architectural history now, isn't it, really? I think. Yes, the back, and then we'll come to the front. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm fascinated by it, and I'm, I'm not quite sure where, where I actually sit, because I'm trying to view what you've talked about this evening with the eye of the Victorians and how they approached this amazing opportunity to discover archaeology. It wouldn't surprise me if these very same people were the next day going to the local circus to see a bearded woman. Okay? There's, there seems to be a, a huge voyeurism about it. And you actually said, yeah, they were trying to educate people in the way of archaeology and science. Do, do you think in contemporary terms it actually met that aim, or was it just merely you know, raising the profile of something for their own for their own benefits? I think that they, they were raising the raising the profile not only for their, their own benefits, they were thoroughly evangelical about this. They truly believed this was a new science, something which would be of national importance. Archaeology is thoroughly nationalistic all the, way all the way from the start. But what you're talking about in terms of other kinds of popular entertainment is important as well, because that's exactly the fine line they were treading, is you have to keep this scholarly so it doesn't look like circus, but it has to still be fascinating and popular enough but the right kind of popular. A good example of this is Pettigrew's Mummy Unrolling, I promise I wouldn't go on, but I will. Um, when he began unrolling my mummies, it was in um, operating theatres at the hospital where he worked for very small, select, invited audiences of scholarly elite men. And he was very, very, it was all very well received in, in his social capital increased enormously. When he was fired from the hospital for corruption and was short of cash, he started doing popular mummy unrollings in theatres where anyone could buy a ticket for a few pennies. And suddenly he's not respectable anymore. Neither is mummy unrolling. Because it's not controlled, it's, it's too open and he's taken it to that freak show extreme. At the same time, this is the period of wider interest in learning and self-improvement. You have mechanics institutes and things like that where ordinary people are trying to educate themselves and improve themselves in clubs. So anything which, which looks like it might be too educational but still a bit working class and apprentice that's not respectable either. So all of these things are on very fine lines. Um, how many mummies were um, unrolled? in that time and how many were left in situ? Um, it's hard to say exactly how many were unrolled. Pettigrew personally unrolled dozens. Um, I think at least 40 or 50, I, I have trouble keeping track of it, but it was a very popular popular thing. People would come back from a visit to Egypt. The, the line was, you haven't really been to Egypt unless you come back with a mummy under one arm and a soft crocodile under the other. And mummies don't last well in the British climate. So when it starts to pong a bit, you might invite the local doctor around and say, can you take it apart for, for, uh, for our amusement? So a lot were unrolled. Petrogu was furious with the British Museum so they wouldn't let him unroll all, all their mummies, <laughs> which he thought was incredibly reactionary of them. So yeah, it, it was something which went on from the late 18th century in Britain through to the early 20th century. Margaret Murray famously un unrolled um, mummies in Manchester around 1910, then it drops away a little bit. It goes back in places like Germany into the 17th century as a scholarly practice. And in America, it was more of a popular um, sort of circus entertainment kind of thing. So it's a huge and bizarre history. I could go on, I won't. Yes, we've got three questions. We'll start with Ben and then we'll work our way around the room. So, uh, um, it's interesting to, to see what you think about. So, um, in terms of uh, the inclusivity in of it, it um, will be a middle class one, and that sort of um, live archaeology 
engagement then but I think compares to today's public archaeology is today's as inclusive um, or is it more of a but that token facade is it is that there's a live real archaeology as it happens and the comparison between the two I think there's still an awful lot of I mean archaeology is still fundamentally middle class that's never going to change it's who we are and um, attempts to widen our audience are admirable and occasionally successful. And of course, everyone's middle class these days anyway, apparently. But no, I think there are changes in the way people expect to learn things. There are changes in the way in which people expect to have information presented to them. And archaeology moves with the time. We think of ourselves as being quite sort of stayed about these things, but actually we're usually on the cutting edge of new forms of popularization, I think. Archaeology got on television when television was pretty new and so on. And it's, yeah, it's, um, it works. I mean, if you look at the, the public archaeology career of people like Mortimer Wheeler, uh, Jukata Hawks, um, there's incredible innovation and from that time, from, from their period of, I say, the 1930s and 40s onwards, um, a very much understanding that public archaeology is for everyone, the entire population, in a much more democratic kind of way, even though they may have personally been appalling snobs. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure if I answered that. Yeah, no, Question right at the back. Yeah, yeah I'm just, I'm going to encourage you to just talk about the movies for like two more minutes. Um, are there any accounts of? What ever happened to them after they were unwrapped? I wonder, like, if, I mean, if, like you said, they might start to smell a little bit and thrown away, but is there any sort of account of them being kept or alert and sort of that is there or not Well, yeah, there, there's a few things. I mean, the Horniman Museum has got a bunch of mummies in their collection which have been pretty much bundled back in a case with all the bandages sort of bundled in there on top of them. Um, but what, what I found in, in Pettigrew's archive was a great letter from the Royal United Services Institute who had a museum where he unrolled a mummy and it was all very, very popular and they, they loved it. And then they wrote to him a year later saying, it's going mouldy, what do we do? And he wrote back and said, basically slap another coat of varnish on it. <laughs> so that's pretty much it. These things were then displayed in museums. So one of his most famous um, mummy unrollings was at the Royal College of Surgeons. And that, I mean, that, that was so popular, the Archbishop of, of Canterbury couldn't get in the door. Tried, but it was crowded out. Um, and that mm, mummy was then displayed in the museum for 100 years, and then it got destroyed in the blitz. So yeah, they were quite often displayed as unrolled mummies, as anatomical specimens, if they came out whole. Much more commonly, they didn't come out whole, and you'd get a piece to take home. You, if you're lucky, you might get a hand or a head. Marilyn Strathern's written about partible people. These mummies are truly partible. And it became a, a thing to, to, to have as part of your cabinet of curiosity or your little on your sh shelf at home. Jane Harrison, the um, classicist, had a piece of mummy cloth framed on her wall. So you'd get a piece to take home. There's another question in the back. Is that still current? Well, it was just another mummy question. <laughs> <laughs> go on, go on. <laughs> Provided it's a different question. Um, you, you mentioned the fact that there was a, uh, they brought back maybe 40 to 50, and there was a 40 to 50 unrollings or whatever. And that is just a very general question. I'm, I'm trying to imagine the populist unrollings. Are we talking about signs all over the town and then you know massive kind of audience of everyone there the whole town goes on and what sort of audiences are we talking about when it became really populist in some cases we're talking about just somebody's drawing room and 10 or 12 of their close friends in some cases we're talking about yeah renting out the largest theater in town and getting yeah lots and lots of people crowding in when it was still novel when it got a bit old hat, maybe a slightly smaller venue, but it was endlessly popular. And it ticks a lot of the Victorian boxes. It's got um, foreigners, death, nudity, corpses, 
Pettigrew's rise to popularity comes just after the, the Anatomy Act. He's a surgeon, bear in mind. And the, the Anatomy Act is when, is when surgeons stop needing to um, rub graves, effectively. So the status of corpses is very marginal in British society at, at that time. But Egyptian corpses are fine because they're alien and other. You, 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 could, you could rewrite, you could write a study of Orientalism in the, in the pure Edward Said sense of the term, just around Victorian attitudes and treatment of Egyptian mummies. It's incredibly re revealing of Victorian culture. Okay, we're going to go to Ashton and then we'll go to Jill. Ashton. I, I was going to ask uh, a similar question, but I, I just want to know if anything has changed. Because for me, uh, the performance is much more important than the, the material that they are presenting. And in a way, we all perform uh, a discipline. Would, would you say there's so much of a difference between what they were doing and what we do now? Um, I would say there isn't a difference in much difference in what we, in what we do. There is a difference in how we understand it and how we present it. Back then, performances were knowledge making in action. Now they're usually demonstrations of established rules, because there are systems of knowledge making which don't re re rely anymore on a, a distinguished man saying, "I was there. I observed that." But there are also rules of uh, exclusion, because you are more or less like saying, um, "This is how we do it. Everyone else who does this uh, cannot belong to the uh, cannot belong to this group unless they have this, uh, you know, qualities." Absolutely, and I, I think the place we see this most all in archaeology is in the disrespect and s scorn for anything popular, for people who do television work, for people who do community archaeology. There is this sense of it's not it's not really top notch work. It can't be, otherwise it wouldn't be popular. I'm not saying that that's always unfair, but the, but the, the very idea that popularizing means non rigorous research that cannot possibly be groundbreaking is very much a hangover of those attitudes still. So yes, it very much does survive. <coughs> You were describing earlier the notion about acquiring skills, and I'm just wondering if you've got any perspective on what happened afterwards in terms of what, what use was made of skills that were acquired. I don't know. That's a really good question. I mean, I think I, th I think the, the most um, visible r r result of this congress is the huge um, number of new county archaeological societies that emerge in the years after this congress as partly effectively regional branches of the BAA or the AI. Um, and when they start to do field work, it is based very much on this sharing of knowledge, sharing of, of, of skills, enabled by railways massively, because you can move around, you can meet, things like that. And the fact that there are annual congresses after this one. So yes, I, I think that that's where we see it. But also, I mean, You've got at this time and before as well, and after as well the, the the excavators, the guys in in the hole, the working class guys who might have been digging up spuds the day before and asked to dig up bones today. There is, there is a growing, it's very small, but growing recognition that some of them are skilled individuals. We learn their names in a very few cases. So that sense of of a archaeology as a trade as a craft just starting to emerge as well there. Yeah. Uh, what's the distinction between uh, the amateur and the professional apart from class? Uh, do the professionals go and get <coughs> formal education? No, it's not so much that it's not amateur professional archaeologists as such, but they are, they are men who are making their living as some kind of professional. Roke Smith, a f pharmacist, Pettigrew's a surgeon. Arguably the only important class distinction anywhere is, do you need to work to live or not? These guys needed to work to have any income at all, whereas the others didn't have to work. They had so land. Academically, they were almost pretty much equal then. Academically, there's no key distinction. This is long before you can study archaeology in, in universities. Um, some of them had university degrees, 
But that doesn't seem to make a huge difference to which side of the divide they were on. No. Um, you mentioned that this distinction between uh, the guys who were doing the digging and the archaeologists. Um, does that sort of distinction still exist or has it blurred or completely disappeared? Um, in this country, I would say it's largely disappeared. There are plenty of places in the world where you can go and, where you can go and do archaeology and there are workmen who dig, local men and women, actually I shouldn't say women, local workers who are employed to dig, who are semi-skilled or skilled, perhaps, or possibly in, if you're someone like Flinders Petrie, you have an incredibly skilled experienced workforce who works with you over years and years and years. But that distinction between the archaeologist who stands on top of his body and observes in colonial garb and the excavators digging, that still exists in parts of the world. Is that a sort of first world, third world divide? Yes broadly speaking, but it's, it's different traditions of archaeology, national traditions of scholarship, um, imperial traditions of, of um, labour and forced labour, it's, yeah, it's um, thoroughly colonial. Any final questions, observations? That's been a fantastic discussion. Thank you. I was just going to make one observation, really, which was um, the um, it just got me thinking a little bit about the press coverage of archaeology conferences, which isn't very common, obviously. Uh, but one conference that I attended that did get a lot of press coverage was the First World Archaeology Congress in 1986, um, and there was a book published about that as well, of course, by Peter Rucko, which documents the, 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 the lead up to the conference and the political context and everything, and the conference itself. Congress itself. And it was also a Congress which had a lot of public events attached to it. So there were a number of um, sort of fringe events almost that involved members of the public. There was a recept there were receptions, there were, there were dances, there were all sorts of things like that. And I just wondered if there was any sort of, I mean, I'm not suggesting there might be any kind of a parallel or anything, but it's, it's, it's quite interesting, I think, that some of the words you'll be using to describe that first Congress resonated a little bit and got me thinking about that 1986 Congress very different scale, very different um, uh, political context, but but also caused splits in the discipline that yeah. haven't completely yeah, yeah. healed yes, indeed. 30 years indeed. on. Yeah, indeed. So, yeah. I mean, I think the, the, the message here is that Congresses are interesting things to think with. If you're interested in the formation of disciplines and the evolution of disciplines, yeah. getting people together in one place is always more than some of its parts. And whack, yeah, the, the book on that, Academic Freedom and Apartheid, I yeah. thoroughly recommend yeah. as a sort of eye-wateringly um, nasty view into archaeology. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay, thank you so much. Thank Fantastic you. Talk. Fragile uh, historic building in the York, in the Yorkshire Dales National Park. Okay, and it's same place, yeah. same time, yeah. and open to everyone. Excellent. Okay. I was just